honor to be here, as they all say. I remember this was a little wee dream in your mind, flying around your little 135 in your Bumblebee helicopter. So I think to be a part of this is something special because everybody is uh, quite passionate about it. My former medical director career was with the fire service, and there, even if you paid people to attend, uh, you would have to avoid the sleeping, the union grievances. So I'm really glad to see that you guys are here because you want to be here. So hopefully we're going to talk about how to calculate tertiary acid base disturbances. No, wait, shoot, that was the other lecture. Okay, no, we're going to go, we're going to go through how to, uh, how to manage an airway. One of the things that I've seen, how many guys are practicing paramedics out there? Oh, sweet, check it out. So I still have my paramedic, and in Pennsylvania we call this a PHP, a pre-hospital physician. There's always a patch for everything in EMS. And... Uh, what I found is that airway management was like passed on from generation to generation with bad stories. Like, I don't know how many, maybe this was just me, but I heard, for example, if you had a really bad patient, uh, one of, and this is my southern accent because I was a paramedic in Gainesville, Florida, and they were like, listen, man, if you have somebody you can't intubate, you just hold both their arms and hang their head off the side of the bed. And I was like, that works. And then I was like slicing apart a bunch of molecula with the Miller blade. I was a Miller marauder, like y'all call me, like, just stab it because I heard the, the, the old wives' tale that well, if you can't see the epiglottis, man, shove the Miller blade in there as far as you can and just let it pop out backwards. I'm like, I'll try that for a little bit. The epiglottis, by the way, does not like to be assaulted at all. It is a friable piece of tissue that likes to bleed and swell if you blow it the wrong way. So then I realized, this is how I got, so all the stories are relevant, right? So then I was a parent, I was like the Crico thyroid automator. I used to, our Craig kit in the Lashwood County Fire Department, and this is a real, a certified freaking redneck, ACFR, man, we... Our, our cry kit, as true as it is in EMS, we had a 6 endotracheal tube stapled to a scalpel, and it was like, cry, and he had underlines on it. So I'm like, how bad could it be, right? I mean, what do you need to know? I had a 400-pound asthmatic that literally died while she was, like, having her inhaler. I think this has exceeded the statute of limitations, so I can probably talk about this. Um, so she's there on the floor turning all sorts of shades of pale, and I'm like, no, no problem. Here's, you know, Ben Lawner. I've intubated at least 8,000 people. Uh, you know, you like to high-five after you tube, and I put the blade in there, and I'm like, I could, I CSS, could not see shit, my CSS event. Can't see shit. And I'm like, well, I'll just do, so I'll hang her head off the bed. And I tried to do, well, she was on the floor, so I had another paramedic lift her up. That didn't happen. So one of the driver operators, who I knew it was a real bad call because the driver operator was out of the freaking vehicle, right? And whenever that happens, shit's going down. He goes, man, you might have to cut her. And I'm like, oh, my God. So we cut her, she bled all the way into the hospital, and I'm like, well, at least I got my airway, I'm sitting there diaphoretic, and an emergency physician, Diane Walker, was like, what in the freaking world are you doing? And she took this little thing called a bougie, slid it down the airway, intubated my patient, and I was like, oh my God, I'm out of a job. So in my experience, I've seen that we all know how to intubate, but we could do a little bit better of a job. So I've kind of approached this to kind of formalize the airway, so a lot of this will be stuff that you already know. So let me know if you have any questions. We'll go fast, but it'll be a nice uh, half-hour jam-packed of some airway goodness. Um, and by the way, this is peer-reviewed. So Zaf Kassim, if he's over there, if I say anything wrong, Phil Naraki, good. These people, quality assurance. He's from Hopkins, so if I'm wrong at all, the Hopkins, uh, the Hopkins mind hive over there will let me know. So is Kathy Vandenbrack, right? Good to see you. So just let me know. All right. So autorotation is one of those events that we practice for, right? It's like, uh, and, and no, no disrespect intended to any of the ground providers, but whenever you have a catastrophic event, what is the pilot reaction time for like autorotation? It's kind of ridiculous. Like if you lose your engines, how much time do you have to react? Well, it depends on how high you are, AGO, right? But pretty much when we're flying low, you don't have a lot of time. So when stuff goes south and you're like, man, I don't know, what to ha I don't know what's gonna happen, it's very difficult. The time you have to adopt an airway plan is very low, so I like to think of us as airway managers to try to plan ahead. So hopefully, when you have your can't see shit, your CSS event, right, you're gonna end up with a tube that's through the cords instead of me reaching for my half made up crate kit, right? So we have checklists, we have evidence-based practices, and we can leverage those to assist us when the airway, this is a beautiful metaphor for a crashing airway, hopefully you won't crash, you won't end up, you know, terribly unprepared, and we will actually intubate our patient, right? So you are going to be the person that's going to be as cold as ice, sliding the tube down through the cords. So this is our objectives today. You guys can, I'll give you the PowerPoint if you want. So this is the meat of the talk, how we're going to develop an airway algorithm, how we're going to recognize it. Uh, by the way, I like to simplify everything because I'm just one of those dumb ER docs that can't calculate a formula to save my life at all. But um, Winter's formula today, and he's on the panel. Where's Dan? Where's Dan? Oh, he's not here. All right. Well, that's good. We'll talk about that on the panel later today. 
But I like to keep things very simple, right? We keep things simple for a reason so we don't have to calculate stuff all the time, right? So for me, what is the definition? How do you guys gauge a difficult airway in here? How do you guys know what a difficult airway is? What's, what's that? Anybody that Kathy cannot intubate? No. What's a difficult airway? Pretty much every single person, right? Like, it is amazing to me. You can do melon, lemon, or lemon, melon potty. You can, you can take bets. But until you get into the epiglottis and realize the uniqueness of somebody's anatomy and you can't see anything but pink Sudsville, you never know. So I just want to keep it easy for you. My airway algorithm, difficult airway, is any airway that you will encounter in the pre-hospital setting. Easy, right? Good. So we'll think about that uh, for the future. And then we'll talk about how to actually get to the goal, which is the meat of the talk. So, all right. We do not pull out. So we're... I didn't make that mean, I'm just, oh. look, I did not set the standard for inappropriateness. There are two years of conferences before me, so just to let you know. So where are we today? Have you guys heard, the other thing is the art of endotracheal intubation is much maligned. If you look at this recent meta-analysis, right, in 2017, I think this is kind of recent literature, the airway success stories are all over the place. So we hear things all the time, like paramedics can't intubate, it's like we're 30% in the esophagus. And it turns out we still have a way to go. And I just want to show you this because this is, this is where we're at. So this article looked at about 130,000 endotracheal tube attempts. And it included flight crews, ground crews, RSI, non-RSI, pooled success rates. So this data is not great. But the problem is, is we have a lot, we have a long way to go, right? Because the problem is, if this is our overall first pass success, for not, this is overall pooled for non-physicians at about maybe 60 to 70%. We know, and I'm not even arguing whether or not to this learned crew, I, I'm not even saying first pass success is the gold standard metric, but this just illustrates to me that we still have improvement to do with respect to intubation. Does that make sense? Would, would that be a fair statement? Because what is the other option, right? When you take somebody's, when you take some, when you're about to, what's a good term? So when you're fixing to buy somebody or give somebody some chemistry and you take somebody's airway away, there's really no other option. If you look at the difficult airway algorithm for anesthesiology, uh, last revised, one of the last iterations was 2011. If you get to a nasty airway, what do you do for the patient? Wake them up, man, cancel the case, right? So you get there, you have your, CHA, your CHF patient, 400 pounds, hypoxic, tachypnic, dying, they desaturate, and you're like, sorry, dude, let's just, let's just cancel. I didn't mean it, right? Not a reality for what we do. The reality for what we do is every time we RSI somebody, a tube theoretically should be through the cords, right? Or an airway should be managed. So we don't have the option of going backwards and saying, how do we unscrew this? How do we suck the succinylcholine? Or if you're Rocky Ronian fans, how do we suck that out of the body, right? So we know that once we go to airway algorithms, we have to get the tube through the cords. And this illustrates that we have a little bit of ways to go. And interestingly enough, trauma is difficult. It seems that we have the easiest time with RSI and if your patient is dead. And we all know that endotracheal tubes save countless lives in cardiac arrest, right? Because nobody in the field dies without some type of tube or piece of plastic in their airway, which is just kind of weird as well, right? And we have lots of tubes. We've got LMAs, SGAs, ILMAs, N NGTAs, King Airways, the tube of death that's the vagal nerve compressor, the, the comba tube, wherever that was. Man, that's a good, how many of y'all remember the, EGT, the, e, the EOA? You, we got some veterans in the house, right? So you should just pop that down there. I can't see the cords, who cares? Let's just totally include the esophagus and hope that something goes in, right? And then what was the difference between that and the EGTA? No, no. See, check out the big brain on bread. No, the difference was it had that port. So when people started to puke, you could divert the port to your partner's face, right? When you insufflated <laughs> the whole stomach with gas. But yeah, you're right. It was for an NG tube, wasn't it? So I'm not convinced that these things represent life-saving etiologies. I think that we need to work a little bit harder on intubation. So when you see something like this, which is a great view with like a glide scope, right? How many of you guys have ever used visual laryngoscopy on a bloody airway? Does it look like that? Right? So you're like, I'm going to deploy my King, my, my King Air, my King LMA, my whatever it is, your McGrath, your Storch. You put it on there, and no matter what anti-fogging device is on the end of the fiber optic device, you're going to see a bunch of blood, and it looks like, it looks like epiglottic camp Pinksville, right? You have no landmarks. And so the question is, how do we position ourselves? Because although the person may have a Cormac Lehane grade of one, we have to prepare ourselves for this view, right? Every one of our patients. So we're going to pre-plan for success, and I'm going to go through a little checklist. And by the way, this checklist is modified, so if you guys have any suggestions, let me know. We can always improve upon it, because I'm sure we have quite a few intubation epiglottic marauders over here, which is pretty good. So first, you guys know about preparation, right? 
Now, this, this is a, a checklist that has gone through a couple of um, iterations. This checklist, uh, we started this over when I was at um, Maryland. Uh, so there's a couple things that apply basically to the hospital setting. But interestingly enough, this checklist contains a couple of things that will help you downstream in case it goes south. So for example, why do we palpate the cricoid cartilage? Who cares about cricoid anymore? In case you have to freaking cut it, right? So I don't care about five newtons of pressure to displace the cricoid cartilage to the left. We all know that that may not work for you, but guess what? If you have a difficult airway and you get into a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, you want to know where that cricoid thyroid is. And guess what? From Baltimore, where our first Baltimore unit was like 100 kilograms of patient, Sometimes it can be very difficult to palpate landmarks in a neck with a lot of pretracheal fat. Interestingly enough, for those of you who are thinking about doing RSI, a little glitchy, but that's cool. We'll talk about that. For those of you thinking about doing rapid sequence intubation, the presence of a second airway operator has been shown to independently reduce the incidence of complications. Now, anybody here from the Maryland State Police? Whew, that's really bad, because I like to tease the Maryland State Police. Now, they do RSI with one person, one provider. They've been doing that for a while. But unless you're the Maryland State Police, the literature would suggest if you're intubating by yourself, that can cause more complications. So I like to, one practice that I like to generalize from the hospital is make sure if you're embarking on RSI, you have somebody else by your side that knows the language and knows what's happening. And sometimes, unfortunately, in the hospital, it's not the respiratory terrorist, but whichever. I didn't want to make them feel left out. So think about it because you cannot suck out the paralytics, right? The other thing is how many of you guys do ear to external notch positioning all the time, every time? Everybody? So ear to sternal notch is very simple. It doesn't matter whether it's a trauma or whichever. This is the external auditory meatus. This is basically the sternal clavicular notch. And you've got to make sure when you arrive on the scene and pull out your hero's cape, your red bag, or wherever your intubation stuff is in, make sure that your, your patients are also positioned for success, right? That means that you have to make sure whether you ramp them up, whatever you do, that make sure that the ear is in line with the sternal notch. Does that... That kind of makes sense too. Let me know if this is something that you haven't heard before. Because the whole goal is you want to make sure to look at the laryngeal axis. You want to make sure that your eyes are drawn to the glottic opening. And by the way, when you watch people intubate, it's some of the most, how many guys train people to intubate, right? So it can be very frustrating. There's lots of ways that people's eyes get drawn into the glottic opening. One is the, I used to call it the Baltimore crab, like where people will intubate and all of a sudden they can't get close enough and so they're like this all the way over there. And then there's that black hole phenomenon where like, your eye, some, you get the, the pirate glance, and then like the black hole draws you into the airway. Keep your distance, just keep your distance. Let your eye, I mean, you've seen this, right? Let your eye be drawn into it. And it's about, it's about six to 12 inches at least to maintain your depth perception. The other thing is make sure you're paralyzing the correct people. There's some people where you just gotta tap out, right? So pride is not the tube through the cords. Pride is when you intubate somebody in spite of their terrible anatomy. And there are a couple of patient populations where you have to think about RSI. One of them is angioedema, where what's the Malampati score of this particular patient? Like 19? They come in and they're like, I took my lisinopril, and they're like, oh. And you can't see anything, right? Because my tricks are above the level of the cords. So if I can't see landmarks, that's going to be a real problem. So we want to make sure that you can see what you need to see. And unfortunately, laryngeal edema or stuff like this, angioedema is going to be very difficult. Burns, disfigurement, things like that. Or a patient like this. So I was searching for difficult airway. I'd be like, listen, man. That's unusual. So in anesthesiology, there's a term called shitting diamonds. That's when you paralyze this person and intubate them on the first pass. The anesthesiologist found that funny. I guess it not, does not go over well. But this is a patient. This, I told you I peer-reviewed everything. This is a patient who I probably would not paralyze, right? I don't, I don't even know where to cut because this is the tracheal crease over. I don't know where the cricoid cartilage is. This is a patient that if you can do fiber optic or something or defer management, or maybe one of your LMAs or something superglottic that may be okay. I mean, I don't even know if this is the sternal notch. Like, how do you? I, I mean, that's important. The other thing is verbalize the plan, because you'll know, like, some people do all this weird stuff. Like, I remember the other airway, one airway I did is um, somebody was bringing in, like, a bunch of scalpels, and I'm like, what the hell is this? And they're like, well, we're warding off the bad juju demons. I'm like, what the heck, man? Make sure if you're going to cut somebody, just verbalize it. Say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and if this doesn't work, we're going to have to cut the neck. And I guarantee you it'll take the anxiety from at least a factor of 10 to maybe a factor of 9.5, right? We all know that cricothyroidotomies are not the most stress uh, or not the most relaxing situation, but if you have to do it, at least call it out as part of your airway plan. So say something and say, we're going to do this. If this doesn't work, I'll do this. But remember, in your airway algorithm and rescue plan, in most cases, it always ends 
with some type of airway. So that's the summary, which is what you all know. All the checklists do, like when you go into your quote unquote auto rotation, or when you're faced with a CSS event, when you're faced with an airway challenge, all this does is ensure that you have all the boxes checked so that you maximize your attempts at glottic exposure. So this is an airway plan. Um, I don't know about you, I think v VL is a great tool, but remember, it has its pitfalls. It has its pitfalls in terms of positioning. Uh, you don't have to worry about positioning when you do it, and it could certainly erode skill. So I don't know, I, for me, I like direct laryngoscopy in the first pass. Uh, VL is a great way to like train people because the learning curve, I think, is, is a little bit less steep. The other thing is make sure you have your scalpel there. Uh, this is another one of my colleagues, Ben Abo, who sent me this after we were working on this lecture, and he's like, I never forget my scalpel because I just tape it to my chest. And I don't know how you feel about managing airways, walking around with a scalpel will tape to your chest, but whatever. So at least he's prepared. There's no running for the scalpel, or, or the, old, the old rule is like tearing up the OB kit to find your scalpel, right? It should be something that is a little bit more accessible. Maybe it's in like one of your flight pockets, or when you, how are you tactical guys out there that have like seven different pockets, you can have a scalpel pocket for your crike plan. Um, I keep it very simple. Um, how many of you guys are allowed to do the cricothyroidotomy procedure or it's authorized in your protocols? Good. So whatever you do, I think a rapid four-step crike plan is always the case. You can fit a bougie anywhere in there. Basically, it's you can make your vertical incision, uh, the horizontal through the, the membrane, then there's always a dilatation of some sort where people go ahead and pass the tube or the bougie, and then the tube goes through the cords. People have all sorts of variations around this. My only suggestion with your cricothyroidotomy is please, like everything else, acid base, airway algorithm, keep it simple. Tom Scalia, a good mentor of mine who knows what he's doing over at Shock Trauma, he's like, you only need two things to get into somebody's orifice. You need a finger and a scalpel. And that kind of works for cricothyroidotomies too, right? So sometimes I, I can dilate with a scalpel. You can just basically turn the butt end of that scalpel up here, 90 degrees, and insert the blade. All right, so the other thing is pre-oxygenation and pre-medication. Now, how many guys heard of apneic oxygenation? So that's where the, it turns out that those nursing home nurses that used to, like, discover people dead at 7 a.m. and put them on 15 liters a minute via nasal cannula, they were on the cutting edge of, of research, right? <laughs> so we always used to say, I can't believe it's 7 a.m. I walked into this cardiac arrest, and this nurse was putting this person on 15 liters a minute via nasal cannula. <laughs> And now I'm like, wow, they were applying apneic oxygenation to extend the safe apnea time. So I would suggest that the, the literature is not entirely clear about outcomes, but put the nasal cannula on, turn it to flush. It's a little bit of what we call CPAP, which may, or positive end expiratory pressure, which may facilitate apneic oxygenation. And then obviously, I don't need to talk to you guys about washout, which is just high flow oxygen. Now this is, I think, where we get ourselves a little bit more in trouble. We talk about pre-medication. And this is another thing that we've complicated, I think, beyond, beyond necessary. Now, the R, um, the R and RSI is rapid, right? So I know this is a very controlled situation, but if you want to, if you want, if you believe that fasciculations cause intracranial pressure, or if you're one of the succinylcholine people that believes that the eyes are gonna fall out when you, when you, when you defasciculate or fasciculate somebody, don't give, a, don't give a fasciculating dose of paralytics, right? We talked about for a while, there was a defasciculating dose. Then we heard lidocaine for head injuries. That doesn't work. We heard about ketamine. Don't give ketamine. The point is, is that RSI is rapid because you are inducing unconsciousness and you are administering paralytics. That's it. So for those of you that like load, how many of you have heard of the load mnemonic, right? Lidocaine, opiates, atropine, defasciculation. Just please send me your literature and I will put it in the next slides. I will put it in the next slideshow. We'll speak all over the country about how we should defasciculate people does not work. Um, whether it's defasciculation, whether it's atropine, two things, induction and paralysis, right? And if you guys want to check this out, uh, Dr. Butcher, Butcher, Bucker, whoever Joshua was, he did a really good review about this, about the neurological injury looked at the world's leading studies, of which there are not very many, about lidocaine and head injury, looked at things like defasciculating doses, and it's interesting sometimes, the the evidence base of what we do sometimes is a little bit lacking. And I think for those of you that use load, it is probably time to reconsider that protocol. Induction and paralysis, RSI, rapid. And for those of you, check it out. I will give you all the articles at the end of the, the, end of the show. For me in pre-medication, all I need are two things. Number one is IV fluid that should be running. There are very few cases. Now, I know we, we maligned normal saline earlier, but one of the things I like to do is at least fill the tank, right? You know the old mantra, resuscitate before you intubate? So I like to have an IV line running because so many of your patients are not optimized, right? 
They have a they have an ASA score of 19 because they're on death's door and they're not resuscitated. And what happens when you have a septic patient who is on the edge of compensation? They're squeezing the last bit of catecholamines out of those poor adrenal glands. What do we give them? We give them like an opiate, right? We give them metomidate. We blunt the sympathetic response. What happens after intubation? They drop their pressure. What does positive pressure do, right? It basically expands the intrathoracic pressure. They drop their pressure. And what are two things you have to avoid in, for example, head injured patients? hypoxia and hypotension. So I always like to have this mixed because once you carry it, and epinephrine is on, ep epinephrine's like ubiquitous, right? Unless it's been affected by one of the drug shortages, which I don't know, Puerto Rico manufactures, I have no idea. What'd you say? That's right, I know, shortages for everything. But grab the code cart piece of epinephrine. Obviously we're not gonna go into push dose pressors here. There's lots of online resources, but they're very simple to make. And as we heard earlier, you don't need to be a mathematician or have a fancy calculator to figure that out. I mean, you literally put one cc of the one to 10,000 solution, and you're giving 10 to 20 mics every five minutes. So when your patient, if your patient is not hemodynamically optimized, you can optimize their pressure before you push the stuff. Now, if you wanna be really cool like an anesthesiologist, you can carry phenylephrine, which is, I think, pretty neat. Uh, that's a pure alpha antagonist. But these are available to you. So hypotension is something we don't have to tolerate. We can resuscitate people before we intubate them, number one. We can have the fluids running, number two. And we can use push dose pressors when appropriate to keep the blood pressure at a respectable level so we don't dump somebody's mat. All right? Now, the other thing is, how many guys are rock uranium fans? All right, how many guys are sucks, sucks heads? They love the sucks and the coin. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things about rock and sucks. And I will just say one other thing. If you look at the Cochrane Review, right? There was a big Cochrane Review, which is where a bunch of experts, probably people from frickin' Hopkins, get together and they pontificate. They're like, well, I don't know, James, what do you think about this study at Hopkins? And they're in smoking jackets. Well, I don't know, it wasn't randomized controlled trials, level two evidence, that's so sorry. So this, this review said, this review said, and this, the last iteration of this review is 2015, said that rock sucks because you don't achieve intubating conditions at 15 to 30 seconds. So I will concede to you that if you want somebody to, if you want somebody to fasciculate the heck out of their face, there is no faster medicine than succinylcholine. The other thing I will say, though, is that is there a safer medicine, right? So SUX has a couple of unpleasant side effects. So just think about SUX and ROC. One has less side effects, and if we give ROC uranium at an appropriate dose, the onset of action, the onset of paralysis approximates SUX. None of us ever give ROC, or fewer of us give ROC at like point, or I'm sorry, 1 to 1.5. If you want to familiarize yourself with ROC and your protocols allow it, give ROC uranium at 1.5 and then your onset to paralysis is gonna be about 45 seconds or so. And that will eliminate the chief objection that everybody has. Uh, and please do not tell me, well, we need to preserve a physical examination for the neurosurgeons. How many of you have seen a neurosurgical physical exam? And I have watched at least five dozen of these before I have talked about this, right? It's like, hey, what's going on, man, neurosurgery? Why the heck you call me the ER? Pupils? And then they order the CT scan on their way out. I'm like, that's, that's the freaking neuro exam? I'm like, wait, dude, what about reflexes? Where's your hammer? And they're like, no, nah, man, we need diffusion-weighted MRI. It's uh, intraparenchymal. We're not going to do anything called neurology. I'm like, what do you guys even do, right? So don't, don't worry about pissing your neurosurgeon off. They're already pissed off by coming to the ED or coming them downstream anyway. So hopefully there's no neurosurgeons. Maybe we'll talk to them on the panel. All right. So that's my summary with rocks and sucks. So wrapping things up here, passing the tube is also very important. And a couple of tips here. Make sure the tongue is all the way to the left we see many times that the intubation attempt starts right when you open the mouth. You're doing the scissor, you put the blade in the mouth, this is called progressive epiglottoscopy, and if you're looking down that blade, okay, by the way, the blade is not a saddle for the tongue, right? It is not, when you're that Miller blade, you sit there, the tongue should not be over there like this, right? The tongue needs to be all the way to the left. So whether you do a zero degree to a 90 degree turn, please make sure the tongue is all the way to the left. Make sure you engage the vollecula. What's that ligament called between the hyoid bone and the epiglottis? It's the hyoepiglottic ligament. You're right. I never knew about this until medical school, and I'm like, oh, that's what gets the epiglottis out of the way. So when you take your Macintosh blade and you basically seat it in the vollecula, it engages that hyoepiglottic ligament and lifts it out of the way. And if you really hate Macintosh blades, which is okay, you can actually use a size four as a Miller blade. You just lift it out of the way anyway. So please make sure to engage the vollecula. Keep your distance, and please use that right hand that's not doing anything. Consider basic, or I'm sorry, backward, upward, rightward pressure, ELM, burp, 
whatever you do, and also call for help. Calling for help is also cool too because it turns out there's something called head elevated laryngoscopy which we'll also go over as well. So here is your tube that needs to be all the way to the left. So this would be the correct position when you're looking down that blade. This is the head elevated laryngos laryngoscopic maneuver. This is why some anesthesiologists have really large bellies. So when you intubate somebody and you can't see and they're at the ear to sternal notch, they just stand up, the head goes up, it lowers the angle between your eyes and the glottic opening and that's all it is. Very difficult for trauma, but in one study, I believe it was 2003 by Levitan, help actually facilitated and improved glottic exposure view. So remember, when you're at the cords, you're like, oh my God, I can't see stuff, and the lights start blinking. Remember, think about it. Number one, engage the vollecula, right? Number two, use ELM. And if that doesn't help, number three, consider head elevated laryngoscopic position. So there's many things that you can do before we abandon that plan. Remember, like we said earlier, don't pull out, right? You're already there. Don't go past the cords. There are many things we can do to actually facilitate our view. So head elevation. And these are all the techniques. The minute you're there and you can't see cords, which I would say nowadays, we don't even have to see cords, right? We got bougies, we've got video laryngoscopes, but please try to maximize your view. And those are all things that you can do while you're still looking down the barrel of an epiglottis, which is great. Those are some really good techniques that we talked about. Make sure that, um, Make sure that you're using the appropriate, oh good, I'm glad we're contacting the server for more information. Make sure you use, make sure you use good technique where we're holding very low on the blade, okay? This prevents you from moving backwards. This is your hand at the junction of the blade and the laryngoscope. This prevents that backward rocking and watch when you, when you see a lot of your colleagues, sometimes what happens inadvertently is the head goes into hyperextension, which is something that we do not want. That only works for the mannequins that we intubate five times a month or whatever it is, right? Mannequins, you need hyperextension. People, ear sternal notch, and you should be lifting towards the feet. The last thing I'm gonna say about tube delivery, and these, all these videos, by the way, um, are on the Airway Cam website for Rich Levitan's site. I'm a little bit biased because he, uh, he does teach the course at University of Maryland when I was there. So if you want to see the videos, uh, it's Airway Cam, and there's a YouTube channel as well. But think about when you're passing the tube, how many of you have heard of the 30 degree bend at the, at the cuff? Good. And the reason why that is, right, and, and yes, we don't always have protractors with us, but the reason why we do a straight to cuff tube is you enter from the side. So when you're passing the tube, you enter from the side of the mouth, the tube goes across the back of the hypopharynx and stays out of your way. Because sometimes when we see the tube going through the cords, we're just seeing the arcuate edge of the tube, right? We see the tube going through. But what's really cool about putting the tube towards the side, it stays out of your view and enables you to um, actually see the cords. And then of course, all of our post-intubation, I recommend a checklist because although I am a rock uranium fan, some of the things that we forget all the time, and this has been borne out in the literature, is that we forget to sedate people on rock uranium because we shut them up because they're combative and inconvenient, and then we notice they're a little bit tachycardic, so make sure you sedate people. Certainly, it, that's when you can actually play with chemistry if you're in the hospital, which is a lot of fun, um, but make sure we do lung protective ventilation. That is something that it has been shown very clearly un unless we actually look at Unless we look at lung protective ventilation in the field, I think we're doing our patients harm and we're increasing the development of possible ARDS. And that is even, um, that is even in the pre-hospital setting. So six per kilo, um, or if you're a fan of the Hamilton vent, that thing will do everything for you. So um, please, and I don't, I'm not paid by Hamilton, although if you're looking for a consultant, hey, we all work very hard. I will go ahead and send this to anybody, um, and I hope that was a good overview. There's a quick picture in the two seconds that are remaining about the, um, the straight to cuff stylet shaping. And then I will certainly give you all my email and I look forward to seeing you at the next. The shape of the stylet can dramatically, with a gently curved arcuate shaped stylet, the midsection of the tracheal tube and stylet occupies and blocks the, the midsection of the maxilla ape so should be the, the tracheal piece. 5 degrees. So this is just showing you basically, there's the progressive epiglottoscopy, it's showing you the engaging of the vollecular, right? Getting it out of the way, a beautiful grade one Cormac Lehane view, and there's how the straight, the straight thing will actually go ahead and obstruct it. Sometimes you can actually see the tube um, when you really need to see the cords. This is just showing you how if you deliver it from the side, ideally, and they're showing off here, showing off a little bit with their amazing progressive epiglottoscopy technique, that this will come in from the side and the tube will stay out of your view. That's ELM, see? 
hypopharynx, distal tip towards the cords, all right? And of course, all of our patients are paralyzed like cadavers, so it's very easy. All right, thank you guys very much.